Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to our second talk on men's health. Um, this is the second, if you're going through sequentially, however, um, you know, weeks, years from now, you might just come across this as the first one. That being said, I strongly, strongly, strongly recommend that you first watch my video on benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is BPH, which is much more common. And the reason is because on exams, you're often asked to distinguish between the two. And so it is very, very important that you know how to do that. So I would digest both of those, both of these videos at the same time, both the BPH video and the prostate cancer video, and you'll have a really good understanding of any question you can run into uh, regarding the prostate, typically of the old man. There are other prostate pathologies, acute prostatitis and so forth, that I do go over in the infectious disease videos. Those are also common, but I talk about them there. If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the I button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. And definitely subscribe to my channel and you will get notifications every time I put a new video up. Okay, so prostate cancer is a primary malignancy of the prostate, and it usually arises in the peripheral zone, so more towards the outside of the prostate, as opposed to BPH, which is usually generated in the transitional zone around the urethra. And that's why BPH tends to cause urinary symptoms, whereas prostate cancer unfortunately does not. And so in many cases, it's not detected until much later in the course. That's a general principle of oncology is that it's good to have cancer symptoms early because you can get it detected. Uh, so it is the number one cause of cancer overall in men if you exclude leukemias and if you exclude, most importantly, skin cancers. Um, you know, squamous cell skin cancer is a dime a dozen. Basal cell skin cancer is a dime a dozen. So we don't include that. All right, now you can get asked this on your exam. So let's take a look at deaths. So cancer deaths in men and women. What is the number one cause of cancer deaths in both men and women? Lung. So lung and bronchus. What about the number two cause in men and women? Well, you got it right here. It's prostate in men and another sex-specific organ, more or less, breast in women. And then the number three and number four cause of death, of cancer death, are uh, the same for men and women. That would be colon as number three, and it would be pancreas as number four. So you can see everything but number two is the same in men and women. Now, what about the number one cause of uh, cancer uh, overall? So diagnoses, not, uh, not deaths it would be the number two in both. So prostate is the most common cancer in men and breast is the most common cancer in women. This gets asked on your exam, so it would behoove you to know this. Now, one in eight men will be diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime. However, only one in 41 men will die of prostate cancer, and that is generally due to the fact that this is diagnosed in much older men who will go on to die for other reasons. Prostate cancer is also very slow, okay? Now, the exact etiology is unknown, um, so it's not necessarily DHT, like what causes BPH, so we don't really know what causes this. However, we do know there are a number of risk factors, obviously being older. Uh, black patients tend to have a higher risk. Uh, patients with a family history have a two and a half time risk of getting prostate cancer if they have a first degree relative. Now, I just wanna skip down to here real quick. Screening for prostate cancer is controversial. Um, so there are no recommendations universally. However, it is generally advised that we take into consideration the patient. So if you're dealing with a 60 year old man who's otherwise healthy, who has a dad and a brother, who were diagnosed with prostate cancer, absolutely it would be a good idea to screen this man. However, if you're dealing with a 48-year-old man, um, he's Asian, um, no history of prostate cancer, probably don't need to screen him. Now, patients are often asymptomatic on presentation, 
Uh, but the suspicion would be raised with a digital rectal exam or a PSA if it is in fact performed. Rarely there are lower urinary tract symptoms, and you can imagine that's if the cancer gets to be big enough. Unlike BPH, which reveals a smooth and confluently enlarged prostate, prostate cancer, and this is important, is associated with a firm or even indurated nodular and irregularly enlarged prostate. Okay, so it's lumpy bumpy as opposed to confluently enlarged like we see in BPH. Here's your anatomy of the prostate. I went into this in the BPH talk, so I'm not going to go into it again here. And again here. So this is the transitional zone. This is usually where BPH starts. And then the peripheral zone, this is where cancer starts. Okay, so upon suspicion, you should get a free and total serum PSA. That is the best initial test. And what you'll see is that they are elevated, but you have a low free to total PSA ratio. So what this means is that you are likely dealing with a cancer as opposed to BPH, where you have a normal free to total PSA ratio. And that's useful for you to know for labs. Uh, further workup, there is something called a pre-biopsy multiparametric MRI of the prostate. This determines the need for biopsy and where you should go. This is not an option on CCS, so I don't think it's going to come up. Prostate biopsy is the most accurate test. And what we can do then is we can grade the cancer. We use what's called the Gleason grading system. And what that looks for is just the degree of anaplasia. And this actually does play some degree of a role in the prognosis. Uh, so what you'll see, of course, is malignant cells, and then at that point we stage, and kind of really the same thing as we ordinarily do for cancers. We want to look for the most common sites of metastasis, so get a CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, and then prostate cancer has a strong tendency to form osteoblastic bone lesions, so we want to get a bone scan. All right, so the staging is based on the TNM system. Do not worry about this. Uh, this is not important for board purposes. I just included it here. Differential, BPH, the DRE is going to feel different. So you will feel a symmetric, confluently enlarged prostate. Make sure it's non-tender. Otherwise, we might be dealing with something else. Um, you'll have an elevated total and free prostate, uh, sorry, PSA. <laughs> Um, and urinary symptoms are very common with BPH because remember that arises around the urethra. Chronic prostatitis, usually several months to years of these lower urinary tract symptoms, similar to what you see in BPH. Occasionally, you can also have dyspareunia, hematospermia. The cause of this is unknown. Um, unlike acute prostatitis, which is commonly bacterial, chronic prostatitis is not necessarily bacterial, and in most instances, we can't identify the cause. Management is going to depend on the progression of the cancer, as well as the patient's baseline health and life expectancy. We do not want to come at 75-year-old men with intense chemotherapy. Why? Because this is a slow cancer. They're likely to die of something else first. So if we give them some sort of hardcore chemotherapy, um, even if we might give it to a 50-year-old man, we could we could actually cause a, a, a premature death in an older man. So you have to balance those things. Um, consider that most of these patients are elderly, um, so we don't want to be too aggressive. So if you're dealing with a localized prostate cancer, a prostate cancer that is contained to the prostate, typically the way we go about this is surgery, and uh, that's a resection, and then external radiation or something called brachytherapy, which is where we insert palladium-based isotopes. I'll show you a picture of that. It's pretty cool. Metastatic prostate cancer, we do androgen blockade. And so this is often referred to as androgen deprivation therapy with these drugs. And most of the time, in many cases, we add docetaxel, which is a cytotoxic, um, but you don't have to. Uh, hormonal treatments, like I said, androgen deprivation therapy, basically what we're doing here is we are antagonizing androgen in one way or another. So there's enzalutamide, uh, that is a testosterone receptor blocker. 
Um, this has been shown to increase survival. There's another one called flutamide. It's older. It's also a testosterone receptor blocker. And then we have luprolide and gasurelin, which are GnRH and uh, agonists, rather. And why does that work? Would, why wouldn't you think that a GnRH agonist would increase testosterone? Well, it depends on whether it's pulsatile or constant. If it's pulsatile and you're simulating physiologic release of GnRH, then you're going to increase the sex hormones. Whereas if it is constant, then you will decrease uh, your release of sex hormones. So that's important. That's an important physiologic concept. And then we have a, a, a biraterone. I've never pronounced that before, um, but it is a drug um, that inhibits 17 hydroxylase, which as you know, is important in steroid synthesis. So it stops androgen production. However, we need to give this this with prednisone because if we just give abiraterone itself, um, we can cause adrenal insufficiency. So make sure you're giving prednisone with that drug if you use it. Very high yield point. Let's say you have a bone metastasis to the spine that's compressing the spinal cord. What do we do? Well, anytime we treat a metastasis, we always start with flutamide or some sort of testosterone receptor blocker. If you go with a GnRH agonist first, you're going to get a flood of testosterone and then you'll have suppression, but that flood of testosterone can worsen things. Um, you'll get a, a growth in the tumor and if it's impinging on the spinal cord, your symptoms will get worse. So always start with a testosterone receptor blocker before going on to a GnRH agonist. 5-alpha reductase inhibitors do not play a role in the management of prostate cancer. They are specifically used for BPH and I suppose male pattern baldness. Okay, this is uh, what I was talking about earlier. These are usually made of a radioactive palladium. And so these are inserted into the prostate and they, they provide this continuous radiation therapy essentially. And you can see it on x-ray. It's kind of cool. All right, so prostate cancer is a primary malignancy of the prostate, usually coming from the outer peripheral zone, it is an adenocarcinoma. It's the second leading cause of cancer death among men in the U.S. It's usually asymptomatic at diagnosis. However, there could be lower urinary tract symptoms. You should suspect this when there's a firm nodular irregular prostate on digital rectal exam. When the total PSA is high, make sure you're looking at the free total PSA ratio. If that is low, meaning you have an abnormally high amount of bound prostate contributing to that total, uh, then that is highly suggestive of prostate cancer, whereas a normal ratio is more suggestive of BPH. Upon suspicion of prostate cancer, get an MRI and prostate biopsy to determine the extent of the disease and the grade. And therapy consists of androgen blockade, radiation, and or surgery. The exact treatment strategy depends on the extent of cancer, the patient's health, the life expectancy, and their wishes.